Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new edition of You Should Have Been Here Last Week, the podcast uh, hosted by myself, Steve Gribbin, and my fellow comic, Paul Ricketts, in which we ask the movers, the shakers, the comedy promoters, the owners, and generally the other people on the other side of the biz, uh, how they got started, what they believe in, and uh, that perennial question, who books this? Yeah. So uh, this week's guest is the fantastic Maureen Younger. Yes, we have to say that Maureen is on both sides because she is, she is also one of the most versatile acts on the circuit. As you're about to see. Today's guest is Maureen Younger, comedian, promoter, woman behind Laughing Cows, based in, uh, was it four cities in the UK and Berlin? Yeah, I didn't do Manchester, but yeah, Birmingham, London, and at one point Berlin and Coventry, Woo-hoo! Leicester. That wow. was my empire. Didn't last yeah. long. <laughs> well, there's funny women as well. Funny women yeah. was on. Hazel O'Keefe started Laughing Cows in Manchester. Yeah. And then I started running the London one and um, made it a success. And then I moved to, I did a Birmingham gig, which made became more successful. And they also did Leicester and Coventry at one point and did a few dates in Berlin. But that was mainly, you know, one of those places where it's basically a holiday with a gig attached to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, you did. You did the stand up in German, though. Yeah, I really did enjoy it. Actually, I, I it went really well, surprisingly well. So I was quite pleased. I've also done it in French, but I definitely, if I had to choose, I'd do it in a English and then B in German. So um, you get German comics who actually prefer gigging in English because the language. You sometimes have to cheat on a grammar in German because yeah. it just doesn't. Otherwise, the punchline comes in too early. <laughs> yeah, it's a lazy cliche, isn't it? Lots of comedians go, "Oh, are you German?" You know, if they're in the audience, go, "Oh, oh my mistake. What would you be doing at a comedy club?" It's like, a, you know, it's not actually true that Germans have no sense of humor. It's just a different sense of humor, isn't it? It's a, di- it's a different sense of humor. For example, you can't be too um, self-deprecating, which British people are. And, yeah. You know, I'm self deprecating in my set. A lot of British people are. And if you're too self deprecating in Germany, nobody laughs. They just come up to you afterwards and go, I think you need to talk to somebody about these issues. <laughs> and you're like, No, no, it's, they're just jokes. I lived in Austria, so I've got uh, Austrian sense of humor is very different to German sense of humor. And Austrians have a great sense of humor. So I, um, I, I there was once a, a, an American couple who lived in Austria and was slagging off the Austrians and their sense of humor which I got really annoyed about because he doesn't even speak German. So it's like, well, how can you, how can you judge a culture if you don't speak the language? <laughs> you <Wow. know? laughs> and, the com- and their comedy is very to do with their language and everything. So I, yeah. I really do like, I do like that. But um, Germans find it hilarious because I've gigged in Germany. They find it hilarious. That I've got an Austrian accent because it's, it's a bit like a German learning English in the West country and going, Hello, my lover. Do you know what I mean? It just... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, they just... And I tell you what, I did a punchline, and um, the punchline was sh- to shag, and I, I used the word schnacksen, which you say in Austria, and nobody in Berlin knew what the hell I was talking about, so they just looked at me. Wow. It was too Aust- <laughs> I was too Austrian for them. <laughs> I, I once had a friend of mine who was a teacher, and she had the strongest Geordie accents in the world, and she went to um, the Zambia to teach the kids... And she taught there for four years. So there's four generations of kids all coming out and going, hello, my name. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't help it. They got the classroom. The parents couldn't understand them. They go, aye, we're getting into class today. <laughs> it's true. You know, I, this is true about the Germans. My, I had an uncle called Theo. My, my auntie married a German guy. And he used to wind me up something rotten when I was about 10, when he used to tell jokes. And this is what he used to do with that impeccable sort of um, German logic. He used to deliberately undermine the jokes. And I'd just be telling really old-fashioned, and he used to say, uh, Uncle Theo, a, a, a horse walked into a bar. And this is what he'd do to a nine-year-old. Well, that is ridiculous. What would a horse be doing in a bar? It's very, <laughs> it's very unhygienic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've got a joke about uh, you, you two have definitely heard it about imaginary boyfriends it doesn't work in Germany and I remember this guy came up to me yes that joke is not logical and I was like well you can't can't argue with that can you <laughs> <laughs> this makes no sense oh god <laughs> we should we should ask some of the questions shouldn't we Paul yes uh, <laughs> so I'm going to ask them then so uh, uh, audience for a all female night then are they different I would say audiences do tend to be. Um, often they were. It's all changed, though, uh, because when I started doing all-female comedy nights, and you two can back me up, you'd never get more than one female act on the bill. 
Yeah. And you'd also never get a female act and a acts of colour on the bill yeah. because you didn't want two speciality acts on at the same time. Uh, that was quotes there. <laughs> <laughs> Air quotes. And um, so you'd never, you'd never act with, you'd never gig with other female comics. And I think a lot of my audience tended to be gay women and they actually liked, for them, it was a great space to come to. Um, they knew they weren't going to get picked on. You know what I mean? They, you know, it was a very, I suppose you'd call it a safe space. Yeah. And I think the attitude is different because they're more supportive and they're more, they're really nice, tend to be really nice gigs. Mm. And um, you just, you know, you didn't have to listen to uh, the bloke before you have him doing a rape joke or something, which mm. at one point was the fashion, as you probably both remember. Yeah. So yes. it, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I would say that perhaps the need for that isn't isn't so much because now you do get more than one woman on the on the bill generally, or two, you know, maybe even get two, three. Um, but you don't get but two I'm, black acts on the bill. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Oh, we don't want to go too far, Paul. Yeah, I know. Um, One at a time. <laughs> Let's start with fifty percent of the population, and we'll work our way down. We'll work our way. But um, but I, you know what? I mean, I still run the occasional one, and I think it, there is something about the atmosphere. Women like it. Certain women like going to those kind of nights. And they're a very nice night to perform at. And for female comics, it's a good time to catch up. Because to be honest, in the old, back in the day, that was the only time you'd see another female comic. I yeah, mean, there were yeah. female comics I'd never seen because I was never on the same bit with them. The only time I'd be on with another female comic was at my night. I mean, but you, you've also done a lot of work on the the, uh, the black circuit as well, haven't you? How How's that different from... I would say you need... Uh, I don't know, Paul, have you done gigs on the black circuit. Yeah, I've done a, a handful. I've done a handful of and I realized that some of them for the younger audience I am not that person that they No, should I, talk. I no, I'm not right for the urban youth. I, I mean, I did have a promoter say to me once you need to work on 20 minutes for the urban youth and I was like, no, you need to book another comic. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I am not the right comic for that for that audience. I would say you need different energy. I don't know if you feel like that. You need like a it's a different yeah. energy from mainstream energy. And the thing with uh, audiences, like on the black circuit, if they like you, they really like you. Yes. I mean, mm. you get such, you get the level of applause and feedback. It's just astronomical. Alternatively, if they don't like you, <laughs> <laughs> it, you are aware of this. Um, mm. <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't tend to heckle. What they will do is they just tend to ignore you. Yeah. Like they'll get, they'll get on their phone, they'll go up to the bar. They just won't pay attention. I mean, I did a gig where, I mean, normally I do really well, but I did a gig once where I did not do well. I would say the audience despised me, but that isn't a strong enough verb. And um, the best thing about it was the next day I had to spend six, six hours in a coach going back from Southport with 80 of them, waiting of the oh, audience. Oh, <laughs> my God. No. That was a very long. I thought I put on my sunglasses; they won't recognise me because I'm a master of disguise. Um, that was a long coach trip. Jesus, yeah, we've all been there, though. Oh, uh, I had to go back once in a long journey back from Lowestoft with uh, Mike Haley driving the car, which I died so badly in front of all my in-laws. And there was a cleaner in the room, and uh, she's going la 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 la. And she goes, "Here, love, don't take no offence, but we ain't scousers round here." La 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 la. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to go back a four hour journey back in the car. I was like, just, I was almost crying. It, it, it was just the cruelest and funniest thing I've ever heard said to me after slaves. It was horrible. We just ate you. Go out. Go on. Go, on, go away. <laughs> I mean, do, do you find, I mean, because you, what's the difference with your promoter hat on i mean how difficult was it to promote? you know what comics are like we're very flaky do you, did you find yeah. it to be a pain sometimes um, i tell you i think it's a really good there's advantage and disadvantage i think the good advantage to promoting i don't i think if you two guys have done it is that you realize how annoying comics can be and then you <laughs> do you know what i mean that like, there are honestly that some of them are idiots and you just think I'm going to make sure when I interact with promoters, <laughs> I am not going to be a wanker like this person. I mean, the inability for your average comic to read an email is a, impressive. Um, you know, because I was, as a comic, I used to I give them real details. I even tell them what bus to get in Birmingham, what stop to get off, you know, where they could park. And the amount of people who would phone me up going, oh, so what time does the show start? Well, I don't know. Why don't you read on the email. Or just even look on the internet because it's not in Narnia, the gig. Do you know what I mean? It's... It, yeah. It's online. Um, you know, people, I mean, I had one comic 
she flaked out once, didn't come to the gig, and then it got. To, then I booked her again to headline, and um, didn't turn up. And luckily, with my gig, they liked me so much. I actually emceed and headlined, which is unusual for most, you know, because people could get really pissed off because they're, mm. they're down one act. But they actually, they actually liked liked it. And then I got a text from her going, "Oh, I fell asleep at seven. Sorry, I missed the gig." <laughs> That's a great one. What's the best? Is that the best excuse you've ever had? What did else? Oh, somebody, I was doing a Pride event. So like out of London. So, you know, if you, if somebody messages you around in London, there's comics everywhere. But, you know, it's out of London. It's Pride. So you've got certain comics c- can only do that gig, really, or correct for that gig. Mm. And because I am a, I'm a comic, I always used to try and get it that I get paid in advance so I could pay the comic the next day. Because as we all know, comics like getting paid straight away. So... Yes. I text this the headliner to say, by the way, I've got the money, so invoice me and I can I can pay you tomorrow. And this was in Coventry, the gig. And she said, oh, I'm up in Glasgow. I uh, I got my diary wrong, I forgot. This was like three hours before the show. Ooh, and then God. she was great. She texted me back and went, hope this won't stop you from booking me again. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> right. And even better, she wrote, because I have turned up the other times. I thought, yeah, but that's, it's not an optional extra, is it? I mean, the minimum you can do when you're booked is turn up. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, you don't my get, God. You don't get brownie points for turning up to the gig, do you? I think it's more than half the battle. Just, <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the most important things is just get there. And then yeah, after that. There in person. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, luckily I got Barbara oh, Nice to take over, who was a much better choice, but... You know, I was like, I'm not booking this person. They're very funny, but I was like, I'm not booking this person again. I mean, have you got any advice for other promoters? I mean, think the top tips for promoters? Um, I think just use comics that are right for your audience. I mean, you know, you, I used to get really irate emails from people who go, because I wouldn't book them. It's like, but you're not right for my audience, you know. You know, not not every comic can play every club. It's just one of those one of those things. And my audience was predominantly gay women. So, you know, I'd, I'd have... Um, New acts, you know, they they try out like an open mic thing. I used to do that twice a year, and I'd say to them, because you know, you get some young female comics they want to do gross out stuff because their generation discovered sex. Because mm. we never, yeah. we never, nobody's ever had sex before this generation, yeah. and um, they do all this gross out stuff, which doesn't really work in a room full of forty middle aged lesbians. Um, talking about, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Talking about cum in your eye, it just you know they're not really really a subject they're into. And I would tell them this. They would obviously ignore me because obviously I don't know what I'm talking about. They would go on stage, they would die, and they go, "Well, that didn't work." And you're thinking, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, so I think with promotion, I kind of knew my audience, and I was very lucky because my audience were very supportive. And it because it was a gap in the market, it it, it kind of sold itself in a way for quite a few years. Hmm. But it was a quite interesting watching experience acts when they're faced with like an audience of like, say 40 lesbians who then try and endear themselves in a way that just doesn't sound like they're not being themselves and the whole th- you know like you yeah. might have seen white acts do that on the black circuit you've yeah. got to be yourself if you try and endear yourself by being not being what you are like i at a black gig i saw a white comic apologize for being white well why do you know what i mean that's not yeah. going to ingratiate yourself with the audience it's going to go what the, yeah. what the hell are you doing that for um and it's you've got to be yourself like i saw uh, an experienced comic pretend that she watched lesbian porn straight women do not watch le- there's nothing there for us <laughs> <laughs> you know everyone's sitting there going no you don't <laughs> <laughs> it is the equivalent of the white uh, the the white male comic girl and i'm with you sisters isn't it yeah you know? oh I mean, did you enjoy doing? I'm asking you a question now. Did you enjoy doing the black gigs, uh, Paul? Yeah, as soon as I worked out, there was an audience there, which is a middle aged black audience, that mm. uh, it, that I was absolutely fine. Because I remember doing one of them it's in Derby, Derby County Football Ground. All black audience, uh, all black acts. But one of the acts is the first time he's done it, and he was panicking like, oh, he was panicking like fuck. And, was he? Uh, and I just said, look, just do what you normally do. Yeah. Do not change what you do at all, because I'm not going to, and that, neither is the uh, the other accent. No, I'm going to just do what I normally do. He did. He went up and went, yo, everyone, yo, yo, motherfucker. He tried to do the stuff that he can't do. Um, died on his <laughs> ass. But middle-aged black people don't talk like that anyway. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> 
And he, he was booked to be the slightly middle class black person he is. That's why he was booked. And they was probably performing in front of middle class black people. Do you yes. mean who don't go yeah. around going? Anyways, I mean it is weird. I mean I do have certain material that I do on the black circuit that I don't do on the mainstream. Um, also, if it's old school, I mean you know this, Paul. If it's old school like Caribbeans, old school Africans, I don't swear. Mm. You know, there's certain subjects that you you don't talk about. Um, I remember once doing an, it was an old school uh, black audience in Ilford and there was a white comic. He doesn't do it. He doesn't do comedy anymore, but he went on and these were old school Caribbeans and he went on and the first joke he did was about shagging it. Oh, it was anal sex. <gasps> Me and Jason Patterson were at the back going, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. And then he talked about shagging his mother. Me and Jason are like, no, 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 no. And then he talked about the size of his penis. And then this guy got up and went, you need to judge your audience and sat back down again. Oh. And he came off and I went, why are you doing this material at this night? And he went, I have, that's all the material I've got. And I went, well, don't do the black circuit. Mm. Because that material will not go down. I mean, younger black audiences are completely different. Yeah. But older black audiences, they don't want to listen to that shit. No. That is a good uh, tip, though, for promoters to know your audience. Yes, know your audience. Did you sort of um, know how things would pan out beforehand? Or did you do any research? Or did you sort of, you know, did you do any ground planning? Because I knew it was a female lineup and a London gig wasn't doing very well. They were about to pack in. I basically, it's all different now, but at the time there was lots of lesbian websites. So I thought, well, this will appeal to gay women. So I absolutely focused on lesbian ah, websites okay, and lesbian yeah. forums. And the advantage of that is that I found that, um, and then I went to Birmingham, King's Heath, which without knowing there's a big gay community in King's Heath. So it was, that was just luck. But, um, <laughs> uh, but there were groups and forums that were really supporting me because they wanted that night to succeed. So that was very lucky for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That you actually did. I mean, you actually targeted it in a, in a sense, you know? Yeah. You see, it'd be different yeah. now because people don't really do those websites and those forums now, do they? Um, mm. It's all social yeah. media, but this is before social media. So that really, really helped me. And I had, um, you know, lesbian websites really positively supporting it because, you know, we obviously we put on gay acts and it was a very, it was a great gig, for, you know, for gay women to go to. So I think it's like finding a hole in the market really, isn't there? I have to mm. ask you this question, though. As someone yeah. who does the black circuit, the Asian circuit, the gay lesbian circuit, and you are none of those three things. <laughs> I know. Also, you'd love this. I got, I, I've got. i had a couple of gigs because I think I'm used to gig a lot in Birmingham, so they thought it was a local comic. So I've had a couple of gigs for being a brummy. <laughs> I haven't told any Birmingham comics that. Um, oh, I know, I probably should have admitted it. It was only after this one, yeah, we just booked you because you're a local comic. I'm thinking, mm, okay. <laughs> um, but do you know what? I think because, I, in a way, I've always been an outsider. So I went to a school that was predominantly black. So I didn't have any white friends until I was 18. And, and then I lived abroad a lot. So I'm kind of used to being the odd one out, if that makes sense. Yeah. And mm, like, yeah. For, for black gigs, like the first time I did one was for um, Upfront Comedy for John Simmett. Great gigs if you ever, ever get to Yeah, we're, we're going to try and get John on to do this. Yeah, yeah he's, he's so good. Yeah. And um, and it's with Felix Dexter, who sadly died, who was a lovely comic. And I was worried because I it was 25 minutes. I barely had 20. You know when you first have a 20 where it's 15 is good and five you've added on just so you can say you've done 20? Yeah. Because you think you're the only one who's ever thought of that. Turns out everybody's done it. And, um, and then it was like... You tell your joke slower just to try <laughs> to spread out time. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was 25 minutes I didn't have 25 minutes but at the time it was like 160 quid which I'd never been offered before so I was like yeah I've got 25 minutes and I was panicking because I was like how the hell am I going to be going hello um, and uh, and then I got chatting to two women in the front and it, it you know like, like it was my kind of my age group they were the, even though it was the other side of London that I grew up from, I'd gone to school with people like them. I'd gone to clubs with people like them. I'd listened to the same music, the same illegal soul stations. So actually, I have more in common with people like that than I would do, say, performing in front of a middle-class white audience in, I don't know, in the Cotswolds. Mm. So, you know, yeah. I, and I am... Um, and I th people can tell, people can tell how, you know, black people can always tell if a white person's growing up around black people. They can just, you know, and I, I remember asking a black journalist friend about that. And he said, it's because you're comfortable. Like, you don't give a shit. And that's true, because that is how I, obviously, if you drop me in South Central LA, I would give a shit. Yeah. But yeah. so would Paul. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? 
But like, I've actually you know, been there. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's a room full of people about my age, I've probably got more in common with them than, say, um, you know, Phoebe and Giles in, in Dorset. Three completely different audiences, aren't they? I mean, you're talking yeah. about uh, urban, black circuit, Asian circuit, which is similar-ish, but not quite it's the similar, same. Not quite the same. Not yeah. quite the same. And then uh, lesbian and gay. Uh, and then mm. also mainstream. Do mm. you feel equally as comfortable in all four different spheres? You know what? There was a point when performing in front of a room of lesbians was actually my favourite because I did it like three or four times a month and it, I was so used to it. But um, I don't know. I mean, the thing is, the response to black and Asian gigs is great. Mm. Mainstream, I used to feel a bit out of depth sometimes. Not out of depth, but like if it was like too white, if it was looked like it was too middle class. Because, you know, sometimes I talk about doing the black circuit. As soon as I said the word black, you could feel people tense up. Mm. Like they think you just committed mm. a hate crime. <laughs> 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 oh, my God, I think she said the word black. And you'd be like, oh, for God's sake. So, yeah. But I think sometimes, and you, you probably agree with me, sometimes you you throw a gig because you invent, you've decided that they're not going to like you. Yeah. And you that's all in your own head. And then, yeah. you know, and you see other acts do it and you're like, why are you doing that? You know, I'd see people go, oh, they're not going to like me. It's like, why are they not going to like you? Yeah. No. I did the gig at the weekend and Mike Gunn, the first thing he said when he turned up was, this is going to be shit. <laughs> the first words as he walked through the door, it wasn't shit because he's got the sense because he's experienced to realise yeah, yeah, yeah. he's, he's talking himself out to the gig, you know. Oh, we, and we've we all, all do done it. it. We yeah. all yeah. do it. And you, you know, you or you, you know, I saw a, a, a an MC recently be so antagonistic towards the, and that's coming from me, t towards the audience, and then not wondering why the audience didn't like her. I was actually mean. It was me, Stefano Paulino, at the back, going what, the? but <laughs> completely unaware. And so we, you, you can do that, and it's just. Uh, but also, I think I'm being sport now because I'm playing better club. I'm playing really nice clubs now, and you get used to it because they're so lovely to play. That when I go to a gig, the type of gig that I used to pl I played for twenty odd years, now yeah. I'm like, oh, don't do this now. I know. Do I have to? The kind of club where if you ask to work to use the good microphone, they go, no, the good <laughs> microphones save for special occasions. No, that's for bingo. <laughs> bingo is the good one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I think it's a good time for us to talk about uh, Russell Brand and because look what happened. The fallout from all of this. We're not going to talk directly about Russell Brand. But okay. I, what I found was uh, interesting was the amount of female comics that uh, were interviewed by newspapers, media outlets, mm. talking about the toxic nature of the comedy circuit. Right. So first off, what did you think about that? Thing is, I started comedy, I was a lot older. And also, I would say I've got quite a defined personality. And um, men tend to a, they're going to pick on somebody a lot younger than me. And also, they're not going to pick on somebody that probably would punch them in the face. So, do you know what I mean? So, yeah. I I think if I'd been a 20-something, it'd be slightly different. But, you know, I started a lot later. Um, and I think you both agree that I look like the type of woman that wouldn't take any crap. And so yeah. I think men, men, predators like that, avoid women like me, like the plague. You know what I mean? I remember when I was in open spot... I was on with, again, all men, and they started talking about um, when they get an erection in the first thing in the morning. And obviously, I did not feel comfortable in that conversation, mm. but I just ignored it. I mean, you know, you get things like, you know, um, I always find the, the biggest supporters of female comics were good, m good male comics, because all comics, all they're interested in is comedy. So they don't care what sex you are. It's, it's how good or how funny you are. Uh, mediocre male comics on the other hand hated you because you were funnier than they were they were so they would often try and give you advice or tell you you know try and say oh i think it'd be better if you did this joke here or, or do you know what i mean and try and put mm. you down in some way but i just you know ignore them i mean i wouldn't be listening to the conversation anyway but my mind would be elsewhere so i think my my age and my personality protected me but it obviously went on um, oh yeah you know, but I, 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 you know, I was, I was just lucky that I was older, and I think th those kind of men pick on newer comics and younger comics mm. because yeah. they're easier targets. What could be done to improve things on the circuit? Oh God, that's a difficult one. I think I don't. I suppose that I really don't know. 
do you think that, that male comics should, uh, at, at the very least, they should call it out when they see it? Yeah, but, you know, but those those guys are very clever. They don't tend to do it in front of male comics. I mean, yeah. I remember when I, I did open spots in front of a, at a big gig and the, the MC afterwards, and I only got, found out when I looked at the DVD, went, I fucked her. I mean, he obviously hadn't, but it undermines you completely. And when I complained yeah. to the co- to the club, they just went, oh, we're just having a laugh. And it's like, well, he's not having a laugh. No. You no. know what I mean? I mean, that that was standard introduction for a long time, which is oh, yeah. a terrible thing to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember once a guy talked about, uh, the guy, guy before me talked about had mutilated vaginas and he had actually pictures, he called them flanges, and he had a picture of mutilated flanges that he was, vaginas, which he showed up or he'd, a three pictures, and then the MC brought me on. We're going. Here's Maureen Young. I hope uh, she's not going to show us her flange. And Jesus, I went up and uh, we had words. I, I also had another guy who I didn't get all of it. Luckily for him, who said, "Oh, Maureen Young likes to be played with down here," and then started fiddling below. And I missed half the conversation. I was like, "What did he say?" And then I remember I basically walked up to him in the interval, frog marched him outside, and said, "You talk about me like that again on stage, I'm going to punch you." No, I said, I've got to clock you one. Oh. And he went back on stage and introduced me as the act who threatened to clock him one. <laughs> 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 but, you know, but all female comics yeah. can tell you of that kind yeah. of... Um, Do you think there's kind. less of it now? I would think so. I mean, I think I'm a hard person, because like me and Jen were talking about this. We're hard people to, to talk to. I mean, Jen... Uh, a lot of male, uh, it's really funny. You get a lot of male comics go to me. Oh, if she wasn't gay, I think if she wasn't gay, she still wouldn't fuck you. But, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, you're kidding yourself. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, we're, we're both women that people don't tend to mess around with. So it's really hard for us to judge. So I'll say yeah, for the uh, cool. audience, that's Jen Brister we're referring to. Jen Brister, the yeah. wonderful Jen Brister. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think yeah. I can be quite confrontational, but that's nothing compared to Bristol when she's in full flow. <laughs> oh, I've like, seen you uh, wielding a handbag. This is years ago when you did um, uh, Edinburgh show. I won't yeah. tell you the people in it, but uh, end of the first night, it was, um, yes, I think you had a, a discussion, disagreement about the money being divvied up, and it was <laughs> handbags at the end of the show. It was just... <laughs> From the handbags. <laughs> I mean, it was the first time I've seen it. It's not the last, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? It's really funny because you sound quite jolly and I'm really happy. But if people piss me off, um, yeah. my North London, I went to a rough school in North London. That 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 young girl turns up. <laughs> well, yeah, I felt sorry for the, uh, the person you were taking on because you were winning by a long shot. <laughs> <laughs> also, I was a much better comic because I know who you're talking about. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> also, part of it. <laughs> oh dear! Thank you for talking to us. It's always great talking it's been to a you, Paul. To be honest, that was brilliant. That we was might brilliant. get you back for a second one, I think. Yeah, definitely. That was more in younger, vivacious as ever. Yeah, she's fantastic. If you want to follow Maureen, go to her website at maureenyounger.com and you'll be able to uh, contact her there. Let us move on to our lexicon, which is a, a, a long phrase this time. Long phrase, but it's the most important one because it's about payment. So it is cash on the night, invoice for backs, check to follow. Often seen <laughs> at the end of an email offering you the gig and giving you the uh, the gig details. <laughs> yes, backs to follow, the most uh, overused three words in the English language apart from I love you. And uh, often not, not true either. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it is my favourite out of the three choices of... Uh, yeah. I mean, cash on the night. Yeah. It, it leads to difficulties, doesn't it? Because you have to find a bank to put the cash in. And there's now one bank for every million people within a 50 square mile radius. So you have to get in the car, which costs you money, drive to the bank. Then you can't go to the machine. You have to go to the counter because you want to put a reference on saying where the gig was. And so as you're stood in this very long queue, people come up to you and go, well, you know, you could use the machine. Yes, I know I could use the machine, but I really need to go to the counter. And of course, you saved up about five or six gigs. So it takes some time. You hand over all these envelopes with gig names written on them. 
and they're going, oh, so uh, what do you do for a living then? And you're thinking, do I tell them? Or do I just say that I'm an enforcer for a criminal gang? <laughs> that would probably be more respectable, wouldn't it? Yeah, you get yeah. less of a conversation <laughs> that way. They'll shut up and just get on with the job. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like they're going to go, like when people say, you tell them you're a comic, they go, oh, I've got one for you. Yeah. You say, I'm an enforcer for a criminal gang. Oh, yeah, my dad's in one of them. Yeah, yeah, he's, uh, <laughs> he's killed three people. Yeah. Do you know the thing about cash on the night, though? That to, uh, brings me back to that thing, because there is there is a thing on the circuit, isn't there? It, back in the day when we used to get cash, is that certain people didn't mind being paid before they went on. Mm. But certain people, it was like, whoa, no. I mean, I, I'm in the latter. I'm very, I was very superstitious about it. I just don't know why. And you, it's not, it's an irrational thing because nine times out of 10, it doesn't go badly. No, it, it has every time I've taken the money before the gig. <laughs> so I don't think uh, it's irrational. I mean, the last time I took the money before the gig uh, was a gig, I think it was the Cavalry in you know, Windsor Barracks. I took the money before the gig, ended up the end of the gig would be trousers around my ankles with my underpants nestling inside them with my cock out. <laughs> thinking to myself, how the hell did I end up in this situation? The curse of the uh, of the early money, eh? Yeah. It's like and, a curse, isn't it? I mean, it's a longer story. I'm just getting to the point there. And I might I might tell well, it on a on a different podcast, but they were shouting, get your cock out. And when you've got two hundred drunken squaddies saying that to you. I ended up doing it. And even then, as I saw the money in my pocket, bulging out of my trousers on the floor of the stage, <laughs> I thought to myself, <laughs> that's the last time I take the money before the gig. Uh, okay. I, I once had a gig so, go so badly. I won't tell you the uh, area of the country it was, but um, it went really badly. And the promoter said to me, I wish I hadn't given you that money now. As <laughs> 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 if I'm going to go, do you know what? Yeah. Oh, come on. Give us a hug. Here's the money back. What am I like? I mean, we should talk about the fact that, um, you know, Bax to follow. The only reason I'm s- sceptical of that, because Bax is instantaneous. But often Bax, Bax to follow doesn't follow uh, instantaneously, does it? It may be one, two, three, four, five weeks later you get the Bax. It's, uh, you know, it depends on who's paying, doesn't it? Yeah. But the one thing I've, I consider an advantage, at least – it goes in. When you get yeah. cash, sometimes the way people pay you with cash, it's like it's a drug deal. They just sidle yeah. up to you and do it in a handshake. Oh, you mean or, like that? Yeah. They do it in a sort of like, you know, how people pass drugs in the, you know, in TV documentaries. Or they yeah. sidle up to you and go, Yeah, I've got your money here. Yeah, I've got, got, got I've got the money. You got any good stuff? The question is always. Do I count it in front of them or not? I, I think you should always count the money in front of them because I'll tell you why. Because uh, when he used to work at the tunnel and up the creek uh, run by the late, great Malcolm Hardy, he deliberately used to underpay you. Hmm. He'd, he'd do, he'd, he would get your money in a brown envelope. He'd draw like a little smiley face. Over, oh, there's your money. And invariably, if you didn't count it, you got home. It's either 10 or 20 quid short. And you'd have to ring him up. You go, oh, I'll give it to you next time you're playing. Yeah, but I'm not playing there for the six weeks. Oh, 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 and then the same thing. So I always now, it doesn't matter if I get paid cash in, I'm like that in front of them. If they do it in front of the audience, as you're just about to uh, leg it to ah. get to another gig at the interval, yes. and yeah, yeah, then yeah. you're thinking, oh my God, they're going to find out I'm only doing this for 75 quid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is that. There is that. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. And, and of course, the other one, but I was telling you to this before, when you get a check now, it's uh, it's almost like a an old fashioned thrill, isn't it? Like going back, to, oh my goodness, like to the days of Victoriana, you know. Because you, it's so rare now to get paid check, and you just like that holding up to the light, going, oh my oh god. There was a um, a uh, promoter who has now disappeared, um, but he actually gave me free bouncing checks in a row. And oh, yeah. I was just saying to him, well, uh, one, I can't believe you're paying with check. I mean, it is such an old fashioned way. There's a part of me that's proud that I've been done with a bouncing check. It makes me feel like a real <laughs> proper comic. <laughs> that is very true. Uh, in this day and age, uh, the money still remains roughly the same as it was. Yes. 25 years ago. <laughs> well, you mean 25? Go, yeah, stick an extra 10 on that and you, you'd still, it'd be less yeah, 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 than it yeah, was yeah, 35 I mean, years ago. 
there are some promoters who put their money up, but yeah, the the, the rate of exchange, as it were, it's not index linked, is it? It's no. not linked to inflation. Yeah, and you can sort of you can tell the difference between the people who pay, uh, pay with bags and the ones who pay with cash. There is an element of fly by nightness for the cash people. Even the the way they say it to you, well, I knew I knew you prefer the cash. No, I don't. Yeah, ten ten years ago, most comics would have gone, oh yeah, cash. Now, of course, it's it is more problems. You've got to declare it anyway. Yeah, and that's part of uh, the comics life is admin chasing stuff that you're owed. Yeah, you know it, that that takes up a large amount of our time. Saying, please, can I have the money? Where is the money? In a good way, it's um, <laughs> it's not performance related. Our pay. There are the odd occasions, especially in corporates, if you don't do the time, you don't get the oh, money or they try man. not to pay you the money. Even if it's going absolutely horrendously, you have to stay on. Just watch, you know, try not to look at your watch. But if you do anything under, even a minute under, they will try and get out of paying you any, any of the money at all. Um, it's, quite, it's quite a well-known uh, trick, so, isn't it, really? It is. And uh, it's advice that was given to me and I've stuck to ever since. If you're dying... Do your time. <laughs> that's that sounds like an old fucking folk song. If you're dying, do your time. <laughs> Even though some acts say if you're dying, get off stage and don't ruin the night for other people. But if you're getting paid, I will still say do your time. Yeah. If you've enjoyed this wonderful podcast, uh, share with your friends, uh, as I always say. Share it. Yeah. And... The other thing, if you watch this on YouTube, subscribe, click the like button. Uh, oh, you yes. can comment like, like, underneath like, 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 like. and ask us any questions or just to, you know, tell us your stories or even suggest promoters that we could talk to. And there's another yeah. one. Oh, yes, ring the bell. I finally remembered. Ring the bell for notifications for, for when the next uh, YouTube one's going to go up. We'll see you uh, on the, the next one, which will be in a fortnight's time. And, yeah, have a good time till then. See you later. Bye. 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 They said you should have been here last week. I swear. You should have been here last week. Oh, yeah. You should have been here last week.